Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green. Glad to be back. Brand new interviews have begun. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and then you can also click on the Patreon link in the description and you can ask the questions of our guests. And we had a couple of Patreons ask, or patrons, I should say, ask questions that will be in today's interview. Uh, I got to thank Stevie Rochelle from Tough and Metal Sludge. He uh, connected me with Mark Ferrari our guest today. And I remember first seeing Mark when he was in a band called Cold Sweat and they uh, were touring with Ingve Malmsteen and uh, Dio. This is the Lock Up the Wolves tour. I'm guessing that's like 90 maybe. Uh, he can remind us. But he's also from the band Keel. That's probably where most people remember him. Um, movies Wayne's World 1 and 2. And then of course he's an author of two books. And so uh, I've had a lot of people on the show who have a similar story. They went to Hollywood in the 80s and they were in a band and they got signed and then um, radio decided and, and TV decided to play grunge music. And some of them didn't have the happiest stories afterwards. Some are still out there um, working, trying it. And uh, But Mark has a really uh, interesting and impressive story about where his career went after the that hard rock scene sort of uh, went away. Anyway, it's enough about me talking. Let's get him here. He'll be here right after this. Please welcome Mark Ferrari. Hey, everybody. Thanks thanks for having me on the show, uh, Jason. Really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to wasting a little time with you, too. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. And it's uh, it's funny, I I'm, I'm, was giving the cliff notes of your career, but I wasn't going to attempt to say the name of your first book because it's a, it's a mouthful. And uh, But now I have it in front of me so I can. Right. Rockstar 101, A Rockstar's Guide to Survival and Success in the Music Business. And, uh, and you are qualified to give this <laughs> advice. I will tell you that because you've been through a lot. As I said in the introduction, the, the stories a lot start the same. You, uh, in the 80s, you, were fa you saw Kiss in the 70s. You were a fan, and you moved to Hollywood, right? That's right. Uh, a Kiss, and actually this, this past weekend, I saw Aerosmith in Vegas, actually just uh, two nights ago. So Kiss and Aerosmith become the only two bands that I have seen in six different decades. Seeing, seeing them all from the 90s, 90s, 1s, and 2s. It's incredible. So, yeah, as you mentioned, you know, my story started similar to a lot of guys. I moved out to Los Angeles in January of 84. And, of course, that was, uh, you know, the, the Sunset Strip was already happening. You know, at that point in time, it really was kind of the start of the glory years of the 80s, uh, uh, you know, hard rock scene here in Los Angeles. I moved here in January of 84. I'm moving out to join a cover band that I was in back in uh, Boston. And our game plan was that everybody was gonna move here. We were gonna put the band back together and get signed. Uh, those guys moved out a few months ahead of me. And by the time I got out here, the, the three of them were ready to move back. <laughs> so uh, Not for I, you know, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I wasn't going back. As a matter of fact, funny story about that. Back in those days, if you bought a round trip ticket, you could sell your unused portion, your return portion. You could sell it. I, I wound up selling my, my return portion because I knew I wasn't going back and I needed the money, you know. Um, so yeah, I got connected to Ron Keel, uh, our mutual friend Mike Barney, and. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I got introduced to Ron in March of 84. So I was only out here less than two months when I connected with Ron. And I, I actually went to the last Steeler show with Ron. I was down in San Diego. Uh, so, you know, he was rebranding, rebooting, you know, whatever you want to call it. The Steeler kind of had been run through the ringer and had been passed on multiple times. So he decided to reboot as Keel and, um, uh, yeah, by the time I was here only four months, five months and had gotten signed and actually recorded two albums in, in well, the first six months I was here in Los Angeles. The right your friends to, uh, probably, and your friends me? probably regret your friends probably regretted going back. They lived seeing well, it. Yeah, well, you know, look, I uh, 
you know, like I said, I, I stuck it out. I had, I had, uh, you know, I had a mission in mind. I had a drive of focus. I, you know, I wasn't mo moving back, you know? So yeah, the, uh, lay down the law album was recorded in June of 84. And then we got signed, uh, to go Mountain A and M. And two months later, you know, we were back in the studio two months later with Gene Simmons uh, recording the right to rock, which, which was recorded in August of 84. So, which is such and a great. Process. Go ahead. Yeah, I know oh, you were saying the rest is history, but yeah, it's yeah. a it's a great it's a great story. You're a kid who grew up listening to Kiss. You come out to Hollywood, and the next thing you know, and pretty soon after, you're in the studio. This is Keel's second record. Uh, you're you're being produced by Gene Simmons. Uh, absolutely a tail wagging the dog story. Yeah, because Kiss was the first concert I I ever saw. You know. And I'm sure there's many others in you know my generation that their first concert was Kiss, and in my case, uh, it was in 1976. I was 14 years old, saw Kiss at the Niagara Falls Convention Center, and yeah, there, there we go. Eight years later, you know, I'm in the studio with you know with Gene Simmons. So uh, yeah, per, you know, what, was, what was it like? Well, we were, you know, I got to tell you, when, when we did rehearsals with him, you know, I think we were all a little intimidated at first, you know, uh, meeting someone of his stature and his importance and his swagger, you know. Um, but, you know, he actually has a he has a funny, silly side to him that, you know, uh, goofy side to him that a lot of people don't see because he's got this tough outer shell, you know. But he was extremely helpful in all aspects of our career, you know, in terms of recording and, and uh, arranging songs. And, uh, um, you know, certainly the cachet of working with him was uh, very important to us, too. Yeah, um, uh, for, for sure. And, and I've had Ron Keel on the show. Ron wasn't great at uh, nostalgia that day. He wanted to okay. talk about uh, the, the products that he's selling and promoting. Um, today, I love Ron, and I've known him for a while when he lived out here in um, Las Vegas. But uh, but so it, it's a uh, it is an amazing time. Uh, just to rewind slightly, Mike Varney, who also lives here in Las Vegas, he ran Shrapnel Records, discovered Ingve Malmsteen for the most part, put him on a plane, and g gave him the money to get here. And uh, and, he and was Ron Keel, Ron Keel picked him up at the airport. <laughs> so, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So all all these people sort of. Uh, interconnected, and you sent a tape to Mike Varney, right? Yeah. So I was, I'm going to guess I was 16, 17, 18, 17, 18 years old. And yeah, because I was, you know, read his column religiously and guitar player. And, you know, um, I did submit a tape to him. He never featured me, but, um, but we stayed in touch. We became, pen, you know, back then it was pen pals, you know, being pen pals. And, you know, I probably called him a couple of times, but I stayed in touch with him through the years. And this is a, this is a real interesting story. The, the, uh, in, in the fall of 83, around Thanksgiving time, when I knew I was moving to Los Angeles, you know, I reached out to Mike. I told him I was going to be coming to California. And, you know, he was living in San Francisco at the time. And I told him I was coming out and would hope to meet him, you know. And uh, that holiday season, he sent me a little care package of some albums, you know, one of them being the Steeler album, right? And I don't know if, if you remember, you know, I've told the story a couple of times of how I met Ron because I wound up running into Mike Varney at a store out here, not knowing he was in L.A., visiting L.A., and um, I was at this store shopping for a leather jacket. Why was I shopping for a leather jacket? Well, the one that I had with me was stolen from the rainbow, right? That was early days, and I didn't know the protocol. Oh, you can't leave anything on the table, you know? So I had this leather jacket that was given to me, um, and I loved the jacket. Had it, you know, had it for a couple of years, you know, in Boston, and I, you know, I left it on, on, on the, you know, left it on, on the chair to go to the bathroom and come back. It was gone. So I'm shopping for another leather jacket and I run into Mike Varney, you know, and I just happened to recognize him in the store. And that was uh, very fortuitous timing because that was the time around the time that Ron was looking to put his new band together. And, and uh, Mike connected me with Ron. So yeah. kind of interesting story how that happened, you know, uh, 
first, you know, having the wrong thing happen to you, and then the right thing came out of that, you know? And yeah, I think sometimes it's a matter of things falling into place, and it's strange sometimes how they, that happens. Mm -hmm. um, during your time with Keel, there, there's a short time pretty early on. Steve Riley played the majority of drums on that Right to Rock album. Not sure exactly how he's credited, but he, he well, did. Yeah. And then he left for Wasp. Uh, you know, right. Wasp was, he, you know, he replaced Tony Richards and was touring um, for that first record. An interesting thing happened. Ron gets, the story is offered to, sing, to sing the singing part in uh, Black Sabbath. Well, okay. So let me give let me give you the chronology. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, we were rehearsing for our very first show, which was at Perkins Palace, in April of '84. Uh, okay, and Ron announced actually before the gig. This was like in you know in the same time that he had gotten the gig with Black Sabbath, right? And so really, we were just going to do this one show and break up, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the Black Sabbath folks came to the gig, right? Because Ron invited them, you know, to, to, to see the gig. And after that gig, things fell apart with Ron and, and the Black Sabbath camp. Now, I don't know if it's, they didn't like his performance. I don't know if, you know, they got cold feet. I don't know. You'd have to ask Ron. But apparently, KLOS had announced that he was the singer, and that wasn't supposed to happen. It was supposed to be hush hush. I think that had something to do with it, too. So, anyways, yeah, so I, it's a funny story. Another funny, uh, you know, bringing back memories here. We were, we were all kind of scrambling, you know, because uh, we knew that after this gig, we weren't going to have a gig. I, I actually auditioned for Lita Ford in that same period of time. And, um, she liked me. <laughs> she, she thought I, you know, reminded her of Joe Perry or somebody. But uh, they needed a keyboard player. They needed a combination keyboard player and, 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 and guitar player. And I wasn't that. I didn't, I didn't play keyboards. But uh, so, you know, a couple of us were auditioning for other bands while we were rehearsing for the Keel show, you know, for the, you know, for the, for the show at Perkins Palace. And then, you know, after that show, you know, Ron didn't get the gig. And so we, you know, back to, back to Keel, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Back to uh, business. Back to business. And then we wound up uh, doing the Mike Barney album, you know, literally six weeks, six to eight weeks after that gig. And then another six to eight weeks, we were back in the studio again. I mean, those, you know, you know, circle back to those days. So much happened so quickly. It was it, it literally for me going to zero to 60 and, you know, felt like I was in a fucking, uh, you know, drag, you know, drag uh, racer, you know. Um, so I think it yeah, a lot happening in a, in a short period of time. Yeah, it doesn't happen that way often uh, to put out an album in 84, 85, 86, and 87. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's uh, pr pretty damn busy. Yeah, absolutely. And Keel was getting some play, and uh, but there was a lot of competition at that time. Did you guys feel like this next one's going to be the one? Uh, the next one being the right to rock or you know, each one. I feel yeah, like each one well, right to rock had, you know, definitely had success, but you yeah. must have been thinking that's just the stepping to the next one. You know, it's like Jason, it's like, it's like playing a slot machine and you're pulling that handle and you're saying, this is the pull. This is, this is the one that's going to be the payoff, you know, and sometimes the numbers align and sometimes they don't, you know, um, but you know, obviously, the, the the right to rock was it came out of the shoot pretty quickly, and I'd like to remind your viewers that uh, Keel did win best new band in Circus Magazine, mm -hmm. and Hit Parader, and Rock Scene. And who did we beat out in, in Circus? We beat out Bon Jovi for best new band. You know, mm -hmm. I mean that's the only time our name has been above Bon Jovi, and we wound up you know supporting Bon Jovi yeah. in '87. So, you know, you you always think that the next one is is going to be the one, you know, for Keel, we never had that huge, huge breakout single. You know, we, we were assigned to a production company called Gold Mountain, who in turn were distributed and the right to rock was distributed by A&M and the next two were distributed by MCA. So we were never signed directly to the label. 
So that might have had also something to do with, you know, why, you know, Keel didn't, you know, we didn't achieve the same level of success as some of our peers. Uh, you know, we certainly, we, we toured a lot, you know, we, we toured pretty constantly for those three years, 85, 86, 87. So, you know, obviously, you know, we, you know, obviously disappointed. We, you know, especially after the Bon Jovi tour, we really thought, you know, this, that was going to just be the rocket ship that, you know, launched us into the stratosphere, but that did, even that didn't happen. So um, certainly disappointed, you know, we were all disappointed in, in uh, you know, the, you know, the lack of sales that we achieved compared to some of our contemporaries. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Uh, I enjoy those Keel records. And I think for people who are discovering these hard rock bands now, there's a younger generation who's finding them. I think people will love the Keel music. It, to some people, it's, it's new for, it's it going to be new for them. But I think there's some really great, catchy songs, and there were some great singles and, uh, and videos yeah. as well. And, and Ron is still out there playing, and you play with some occasionally, right? Well, yeah, Keel, you know, Keel plays occasionally, as you mentioned. You know, we uh, we kind of got back together in 2009 was our 25 year anniversary, so we decided to celebrate that, and that's when we got to we got back and did our first show in 20 years, 21 years for me. I, mean, I took a 21 year break. And Keel and other stuff going on in between that. Um, and since then, you know, we have, you know, we, we've gone to Europe four or five times. We've done the cruises four or five times, M3, Rocklahoma, you know, other, you know, festivals. It's sporadic, uh, but we do, we do play, you know, we do play. Yeah. And uh, we actually haven't played since uh, Monsters of Rock 2020. Our, our cruise was the last cruise out, man. We, our, our cruise docked second week of February, and then everything, everything, you know, shut down after that. So yeah. we are hoping, we are hoping, uh, we, we, well, we done, we did Keel Fest also in there, and we just booked another Keel Fest for uh, for March of next year. So that's our, that's our next show so far. Which will be. It's uh, great, it's great that people get to still see the band. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh... It's great to, for the hardcore fans and for the people who are, are like I said, discovering uh, some of these music for the first time. Mark, I got to ask you about this record right here. Ah, yeah. I, I haven't heard you speak about this. I'm sure you have. This is Pantera's fourth record, but the first with Phil Anselmo. That's right. And, uh, yeah, you wrote a song on this record, oh. right? Yeah, well, the song you're speaking about is called Proud to be Loud, which originally was demoed for the Keel album, 1987 Keel album. So I think we put that version on back in action, if I'm not mistaken. But, it, it, you know, I thought it was going to make that album. <laughs> and, you know, I don't even remember why it didn't. I certainly was strong enough to. And... Um, I had been working with the Pantera guys since 1985. I mean, they, they came to see us on our first swing through Texas. And, uh, you know, first time, the first time I popped their cassette in, I think it was projects in the jungle, you know, I, I was just floored, you know, I, and they, they were a much different band back then with Terry Glaze. They were definitely commercial, you know, it really was Doc and meets Motley Crue, you know, with a little priest in there. And then when they, when they got Phil, obviously this album's a lot heavier. And I'd say would probably lean more towards the Judas Priest style of things and not as heavy as where they wound up, you know, later. Uh, and so I, you know, I started waving the Pantera flag really, really early. And as a matter of fact, I got them signed to Gold Mountain Records. And again, back then, Gold Mountain was a production, it was a production deal. So they had to go get distribution for them. And they just, weren't able to do it. They were, Pantera was ahead of their time. And I was the first guy to, you know, to get them national press and metal edge and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so I used to go down there to hang out with them just for weekends. I used to, just a lot, you know, they were, it, you know, as you know, those guys were just a fun bunch to be around, <laughs> you know, so, um, but uh, they liked that song, Proud to Be Loud. I wound up, you know, going down there and producing uh, the session for that song and, in addition to playing rhythm guitar on that song, I also play a solo on another song on that album called We'll Meet Again. And um, I've been told that th there's only two guys that have ever guessed it on a Pantera record, me and Kerry King, 
So I guess mm -hmm. that puts me in, you know, pretty rarefied company. For sure. Uh, so, but uh, I, you know, I love those guys, and you know, obviously, uh, it was just crushed, you know, uh, when Daryl was killed and when Vinny passed. Uh, I'm still in touch with their dad, and I still stay in touch with Rex. Yeah, Vinny lived here in Las Vegas. Uh, That's saw, right. Saw him all the time. Uh, he came to see my band play maybe three days before he passed. It was uh, mm -hmm. obviously a, a difficult thing. But also when Ron Keel was living here, it was a very common thing to go out and see Vinny Paul and Ron Keel at the same place. I, and and Vinny always wanted to hear the bands play, as you said, yeah. you know, Knock In or Rat. Uh, he, that, that was his thing. Yeah. In well, addition to metal, yeah. You know, uh, it's one of my proudest uh, professional achievements, you know, uh, being the guy that kind of started waving waving their flag very early on, you know. And, I mean, they would have they would have happened with or without my help, you know. But I'm um, just, you know, real happy and real proud to be a part of their story. Yeah. Uh, definitely a big part of uh, that, that history. Sorry, I know we got a little echo. Um, so does Keel break up? Or what what happens in, in the in the last record's eighty seven? What happens yeah. there? Well, uh, as mentioned, you know, we came off, you know, we came off the Bon Jovi tour, you know, playing the biggest you know, biggest sold out arenas, fifteen, twenty thousand a night, multiple nights and you know, huge venues, Madison Square Garden, Nassau Coliseum, you know, stuff like that. We and we come off of that and they're like we're playing clubs. You know, we didn't even get we didn't even get another tour that year. It was just that it, it, we didn't go back to Europe. We didn't go back to Japan. You know, all these places we went in 86. And in some ways, it was a step backwards, you know, 1987. And at the end of 87, um, you know, everybody was frustrated. You know, and there's finger pointing and there's, you know, a lot of, you know, armchair quarterbacking going on. and we wind up uh gold mountain was one uh, was switching their distribution that year to, from mca to atlantic and jason flom was brought in as the anr guy and i loved you know jason and i are, are close to this day and um uh, i i love the guy a lot but he and ron did not click you know and ron just thought i think suggestions were made to bring in a keyboard player you know and we did bring in a keyboard player. I think we brought in Scott Wolf originally. Um, I think Scott was in there, and there's a few other keyboard players in there. Um, and this, I thought we should stick to our guns and do what Keel did best, which was that you know the full throttle two guitar uh, stuff. You know, Priest meets ACDC. You know that kind of stuff that was working for us. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I disagreed with I disagreed with the you know the whole keyboard thing, and um, as, as Scott Warren, by the way, I'm sorry, was was in there too. Oh, Scott Warren, yeah, played with Heaven. Yeah. yeah, he was he was in there too. Um, and I just uh, you know I, Ron and I just disagreed, and I I didn't want to be a thorn in the side. And so I, st I stepped out, I stepped down and I left the band. This would have been in, uh, I'm going to say early 88, you know, cause I know we, we, we played a Christmas show. My last show with Keel was uh, Christmas week at, uh, um, in Pasadena, not Pasadena at, um, country club. And I think Warren was on that bill and Warren and, uh, I think Lion. Uh, anyways, that was the last show I did, and so by by spring of '88, I was out, and I and I started right away demoing, you know, for whatever would be the next thing, and uh, you know, finding Oni Logan in Florida through a mutual friend and bringing him out and doing several rounds of demos, and um, you know. That was a, a two-year process uh, to, to get the Cold Sweat record out. Lots of twists and turns, you know, with only leaving the only Mark, leaving the I'm going to cut you off to, yeah. to, to get the punchline. This is one of my favorite stories. I've heard it forever. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I believe I asked George Lynch on the show. 
Um, this one's gone around uh, in infamy. That you were playing, was it the whiskey you were playing? Yeah. Mm. Playing the whiskey with Oni Logan as your singer. Was the band called Cold, Cold Sweat? It might have been called, no, I think it was called Ferrari at the time. Yeah, that's, that's right. Another, that's right. another yeah. story because the band was called Ferrari. Uh, we, we, we can talk about that too. So yeah, you're, you're going to ask me about the famous thing that's, that uh, that George said to Oni, and I wasn't there to hear it. I was upstairs or whatever, but, you know, apparently he made some wise-ass comment. You know, you want to play in a band in a Ferrari, you want to, you know, uh, or, or do you, you want to drive one? <laughs> it's, I have some classic line, I got to admit, you know. Uh, so, you know, look, in the beginning, you know, in, back in those days, definitely George wasn't my favorite guy, but we are all good now. We're, we're buds. He came to my birthday party. We've been to each other's houses. I made a donation to help his movie. Uh, we talk all the time. We're, we're car guys. We're hiking guys. I love the guy. And in retrospect, he did me a favor. I mean, it wasn't apparent at the time, but look, I mean, only left after the first, you know, after the first uh, Lynch Mob record, you know, right. and Oni, I love the guy too, and we've made our peace and everything. But you know, he he is of a certain personality and and uh, certain quirks and everything, and um, you know, things happen for a reason. It wasn't apparent to me at the time, and and I thought the timing was pretty shitty, you know, both uh, both on George's part and Oni's part. But all is forgiven. We're all good. We all love each other. I got no animosity. And uh, again, I, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those stories, you know, those, uh, stories that keeps getting circulated. Uh, yeah, but I, I didn't you. hear it. But, uh, you know, apparently it was. <laughs> yeah, I think it's one of those stories that uh, lives on in mythology. Yeah, folklore. <laughs> yeah, I folklore. Mean, and you hear it every now and then. People bring it up. But uh, like you said, in the long run, you probably did. Uh, he, he did you maybe a little bit of a favor. And the singer that you get for Cold Sweat, Rory, is uh, really everybody loves and still talks about him. I saw you guys uh, recently at the Monsters on the Mountain yeah. Festival, and yeah. the band still sounds great. And it's great that you still do it. So many people you know, could walk away and say, I don't need to do that. But uh, like I said before, people want to see these bands that they missed. They didn't get a chance. Like I said... I was at a wedding the other day with Rowan Robertson. He was there as well from Dio. He was probably 17 on that tour. And oh. I remember seeing in New York City at the Ritz, which was Studio 54, Cold Sweat, Ingve uh, uh, Malmsteen, talk about a, a, a personalities on this bill, and then uh, a Dio. And Cold Sweat was another one of those bands that unfortunately probably came out at a time when you were the Metal Edge pinup but it was hard to get the uh, the play that you guys deserve. Yeah, well, they say timing is everything. With Cold Sweat, you know, that album should have, you know, had we uh, released that album when it should have been released, which would have been uh, 88, late 88, early 89, I think if we would have had a slightly different trajectory. But by the time 1990 rolled around, as we all know, you know, musical tastes were starting to shift. And... Um, MCA was not known as the greatest rock label to begin with. They had a ton of bands on the roster at that point in time. Um, you know, we we got a decent shake at it. You know, we got a, got the one video out there. We did tour with Dio. We did a fair amount of touring with other bands. But again, it was around that period of time where he had so many commercial hard rock bands out there. I, I, I just, I think just people, you know, program directors and, and, and people in general were just getting tired of it. You know, it's like, you know, it's like if you if you went to the buffet line ten times and and picked out ten times, you, you're you're done. You're stuffed. You can't put another you know ounce of food in you. And I think that's, you know, an analogy the same way with this music with the music in general. That there was a lot of hair bands, commercial you know commercial hard rock bands that were signed and being pushed out in those years. You know. Uh, and the public was just getting full of it. <laughs> so we, um, you know, we, 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 you know, cold sweat, unfortunately did not, uh, you know, do as well as we all would have liked, you know, but look, I'm, I'm not bitter, man. I had two turns at bat, you know, and, uh, um, don't regret a single minute. I'm not bitter about anything, you know? 
one of the things I like about you and your story is that now you can go out and play with Cold Sweat or you can play with Keel, not because you have to pay your bills to do it, it or, or, you know, you're looking for the next deal. You can do it because you love that music and sharing that um, with your band and with an audience. And, the, and I think that's something that, that shows. And we'll talk a little bit about the other things that you made happen after that. But I got to get to this because everyone wants to know. Uh, and my Patreons, this was the most asked question. Sean uh, wrote in. He wanted to know if you had any stories about uh, this movie. <laughs> yeah. This will, well, this will be with you forever. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Um, well, lots of great stories. Um, I'll tell you the story how I got the gig. I've, I've, I've said that a few times, but uh, I, you know, uh, Keel did a video with Penelope Spheris in 1987. We did uh, Rock and Roll Outlaw with her. So that song was on a soundtrack for a movie called Dudes, D U D E S. John Cryer was in it, um, Daniel Roebuck. And uh, so we got the, the first single off, off that album. We got to do a video with her. We shot it at Paramount Ranch, which burned down in the Woolsey fire a couple of years ago. Uh, and I was staying in touch with her. You know, Penelope was also doing A&R at that time. And um, when I read somewhere, she was tapped to uh, direct Wayne's World. I, I originally reached out to her to see if I could help on the music side. You know, you need any background music, you know, whatever. And she said, well, I got that covered, but I do need a guitar player for the film. <laughs> I'm putting together a band for Tia Carrera. And... Um, Fortunately, they went with the two guitar band. The other guitar player was uh, uh, the guy playing the Strat there was her boyfriend at the time, George Foster. And you got Anthony Fox there uh, playing drums. Anthony was uh, Alice Cooper's band and then Beautiful uh, beautiful Creatures on Warner Brothers. And there's me in the back. So, right in between, yeah. Yeah, so th that was my whole summer in 1991 uh, was doing that movie. Amazing experience, you know, being – on the set, you know, uh, and the band was in a lot of lot of scenes in that first film. So, you know, I did scenes with with Rob Lowe. I did scenes with, uh, you know, obviously Dana Carvey, Mike Myers. Uh, yeah, that's that's from Wayne's World too. Okay, so you'll notice that the guy uh, on the far right, he was the keyboard player. It was his name was Steve Krasinski. He had a, and he went on to play. Uh, in Private Life, which was signed to Warner Brothers and produced by Van Halen. Yeah. That picture there is from Wayne's World 2. Well, Wayne's World 1, the band was was in a lot more scenes than Wayne's World 2. And uh, just, you know, so many, you know, crazy, you know, great memories of just hanging out with the crew and the, and the stars. And, and, you know, I don't think anybody knew at the time how big uh, Wayne's World was going to be. You know, it turned out, I think that year... 1991 it was one of the highest grossing movies of the year and at the time it was the highest grossing comedy of all time uh and it just became such a cultural icon you know it, that it that queen, it, you know if, you're, if you think about it all Bob of a sudden queen. yeah young yeah. Kid, that scene with bohemian rhapsody comes out there's a video and all of a sudden every young kid wants to hear queen yeah. again or for the first time yeah so wayne's world too some some cool things. Um, we did the studio scene and the Wayne's World 2, the band only appears twice. In the very beginning when they are recording and Christopher Walken is the uh, is the, the manager or the producer and you know he's showing he's showing uh, somebody how to play a guitar lick. So I, I got to do you know an afternoon with Christopher Walken, which wasn't bad. Mm -hmm. And then um, Wayne Stock, <laughs> which was uh, filmed over the course of a couple days. Errol Smith. So, you know, hey, I just saw Errol Smith 48 hours ago in, in Vegas, as, as you know. Uh, so, you know, hanging out with the Errol Smith guys for a couple days, just, you know, a mind blower. P and most people won't know this, but Peter Frampton was actually um, – he was actually supposed to be in, Way in uh, Wayne Stock, and he was there too. You know, he was hanging out. And I don't know why, what happened, why they didn't shoot him, or he wasn't in the film. But uh, he was there, and you know, Peter Frampton. You know, I've, I stole so so many licks from him. You know, and you know, 
he's an amazing guitar player. I mean, uh, put aside the the pop star looks and all that stuff, and put aside Sergeant Pepper's, which you know helped ruin his career. He, he's he's an amazing melodic just phrasing. His melody is just you know he's un, unsurpassed. So just you know the Wayne Stock thing was was great too. You know, and hanging out with those guys for you know a couple of days is amazing experience for. Him. Yeah, I mean, how many people have on and their Chris, resume? And Chris Farley, too. Chris Farley played the roadie. Uh, Chris Farley, well, he actually was in both films, but he uh, uh, he played this this the roadie in, uh, in, in Wayne Stock. <laughs> he was there for a couple of days and just hanging out with him and just, you know, absorbing his greatness, you know. It, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, like I was saying, how many people have on their resume, you know, uh, Signed to a major record deal, toured the world with these legends, uh, mm -hmm. you know, did all these things. Co-starred with Christopher Walken and yeah. and appeared in two movies that will be, you know, people will be seeing these movies forever and rediscovering them uh, constantly. Well, they should do Wayne's World 3, WW3. Uh, hope they do it. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 you have to think that somewhere on the, I think those two had a fallout for a minute and maybe they worked it out and hopefully they'll be... Uh, that that will happen so okay so it's an interesting thing those years 90 92 get lean for people who are in hard rock bands mm -hmm. you did the movies you were doing other things you were already on to the next thing you you were smart enough to sit down and come up with this uh you, you started to learn about uh, uh the production end of things and publishing and music, and you started building your own library. Maybe you didn't even know that that's what you were doing. So tell me a little about how Master Source begins. Yeah, well, it happened pretty organically, I can tell you that. So, you know, I was always uh, acutely aware of soundtracks. You know, actually, Keel had, Keel had uh, a couple of songs in soundtracks, one of them being uh, this movie called Daryl, D-A-R-Y-L. Um, I remember and, that movie. Yeah, I don't think I've watched it since it came out, but yeah. data uh, analyzing robot youth life form. That was the best yeah. Well, you got one on me. I didn't even know what it stood for. And you know, of course, Keel was on the soundtrack for Dude. So, you know, the, in those years, you know, 90, 91, 92 were were definitely lean years, you know. And it was around that period of time that I started, I started getting some of my demo recordings used in TV shows and films. I had friends that were working, you know, as assistant coffee makers or you know, assistant grips or gophers or whatever on some of these films. And a couple of them were, you know, friends with the director and the director would say, you know, Hey, you know, these rock guys, I want a piece of rock music for this bar scene, you know, go find me some rock music, you know, and, I remember getting a couple of these calls, you know, hey, I'm working on this film and uh, they want some rock music. They can't afford anything, uh, you know, they can't afford anything major label. And, you know, do you got anything they can use? And I'd let them use my demos, you know, and, you know, wound up getting, you know, a couple hundred bucks or whatever it was, and getting a screen credit. But more importantly, I got an idea. That was my aha moment, you know, when I started getting some of this stuff happening and making some money. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, if I, I could place a song in one film, maybe I can place it in another, you know? And that was the start of what became the next part of my career, you know, is developing this music library. So if you roll the clock back to the early nineties, if you were a filmmaker or TV show producer, and you wanted a piece of pop music, say you wanted a, a rock song, you wanted an ACDC, you know, or Van Halen or, you know, Kiss, you know, those were your choices, you weren't going to get it. You know, it was way expensive, would take forever to license. And um, on the TV side, you know, these shows were filming weekly, you know, they need this music fast. You know, they, they're not going to take four months to clear a song and, you know, pay $100,000 for 15 seconds worth of music, you know. So my idea was, you know what, you're not going to get these songs or it's going to be prohibitively expensive and it's going to take you forever to clear it. So, you know what, I can produce something for you that generically sounds like ACDC or generically sounds like Madonna or generically sounds like Garth Brooks or whoever it was they were trying to license. You, know, you can have it next week and you can take a decimal point or two off the, the code, you know, that was my idea. 
And nobody was doing that in the early 90s. There were music libraries that existed before me, but none of them had songs, none of them. You know, my, my focus was pop music, creating music that sounded generically similar to whoever they were trying to, without ripping these guys off, I want to be very clear, they never you know, ripped anybody off, but it was producing music that was in the ballpark of the aforementioned artists that I just mentioned, you know? And my idea took off like a fucking rocket. <laughs> so I was the top, you know, I was like the guy that you know, all the studios would be calling, you know, oh, you know, this week we need a Garth Brooks song. Oh, this week we need a Van Halen song. Oh, this week we need this, we need that, we need that, you know. And I was off and running. And I built that uh, library up over the course of 12, 13 years. And then I, I sold it to Universal in 2007, cashed in my chips. And uh, then I, then for the next five years, I ran the business that I sold to them as a division president at Universal Music Publishing. And um, I actually stepped down 10 years ago from being a full-time employee. And now um, I'm an outside producer. I'm still producing music for the, uh, you know, for the library that I sold to them all those years ago. I have other clients that I produce music for. Um, so that's been my day job still. You know? So. you know, I don't think a lot of people realize that you know, before you, people were giving like cue, music cues, they would call it, and it would be maybe an instrumental part here or a small thing there, but not songs, as you're saying. You were actually smart enough to say, I'll record songs in the vein of these artists. Yeah. And yeah, you make the point to license a song, especially then, it could take forever. And you go through lawyers and you go through publishers and... Uh, so you had the you had the answer, and it's something that stuck because to this day, uh, there's plenty of a yeah. or turn on Cinemax at night or HBO yeah. and see a movie. Yep. There's someone has a rock song in it. Well, and I, you know, when I started this, it, it, you know, this was kind of the this, you know, back in the early '90s is when TV started using pop music uh, a lot more. You know, all the spelling shows. You know, Party of Five, uh, 90210, Melrose Place. Those those were early shows that started using pop music. Now it's ubiquitous. You know, almost every show's got a, some piece of pop music in there. But in the early 90s, like when I started, you know, again, it was just starting to happen. And nobody, you know, nobody was producing this stuff for them at the speed and at the economy that I was doing. And that, that's, so that was my secret sauce. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mark, were there people that we know that were uh, playing with you, recording with you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I hired a lot of my my buddies, you know, have contributed a master source throughout the years. Uh, Tommy Thayer, Robin McCauley, uh, Kip Winger, Mark Slaughter, uh, Ty from King's X, uh, Dan Reed from the Dan Reed Network. Uh, and I know I'm missing, a, you know, I'm missing a few. But, yeah, I I, you know, looped in my buddies to, to, to help write, you know, or hire them directly, you know. Um, and they're happy they did because they're still earning money for these songs that, you know, were recorded 25 years ago. I was going to say you are a great friend to have. Uh, mm -hmm. There's nothing, especially in some of those leaner years to get yeah. this. And you were so ahead of your uh, of your time. Did you have to invest in a studio? I mean, what it was different technology? You know, people yeah. don't realize you weren't well, sharing files. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I never, I never uh, bought a studio, and I had very minimal um, studio gear myself. And very early on, I realized that the best value that I could bring for my you know, for my time was to run the company, and not be in the studio all day recording a track. I would much rather be on the phone all day, bringing in a new business. So I, I, you know, I hired guys that that had their own studios or whatever. Uh, I, I wrote, co-wrote some of the songs with them, but I wasn't in the studio all day, you know. And again, because my time was better spent, you know, my time was better spent bringing a new new business, you know. So even okay. to this day, even to this day, I I don't I you know, I don't even record you know the stuff that I I co-write I'll co-write with with friends but they record it you know and these and these days you know with with a laptop you know with the MacBook Pro and decent software everybody's self-contained 
you know, I don't even know anybody that goes into a real recording studio anymore, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Bands can make whole records from different parts of the world. Uh, but you were smart to know your your, your strength. And I, I've heard you speak and give the advice a little bit about uh, networking and getting out there and taking those chances and getting in the face of people. Send that email. You know, I feel like most people fail because they don't take the first step. This is in any job, in the music industry or entertainment especially. But, well, I should do this or I should do that, but have that fear of doing it. And then some people take that step but don't have the product to back it up. They take the step. They send you 50 songs every day. I'm sure you get them in your mail. But everyone does. And you go, wow, I can't believe they sent me this. But you had the product. You had the confidence. And you, you took a chance. Yeah, well, I didn't I didn't wait till, you know, for the phone to ring. You know, I, I, I was the guy ringing the phone on the other end, you know. Uh, so, you know, look, it is it's a con. It's they say there's left brain and right brain and, you know, left brain is more. Yeah. Left brain is more um, creative and right brain is more analytical. I, I, I got a little of both, so I guess I'm half brain. You know, I, I don't know. I, I was lu lucky that I, you know, I, I got a little bit of both, you know, a little bit on the creative side. And I've, I've always, for some reason, been really good with, with data and numbers and, and you know, on the, on the business end of things. There's usually somebody in the band that, has, that, that does that. And I've always been the guy in all my bands that was – the business guy, you know, whether it's, you know, talking to the booking agent or, you know, getting paid at the gig or, you know, renting a truck or whatever, whatever it is, you know, I've, it's, I've always been that guy, you know? Yeah. I'm showing, <laughs> uh, showing the book cover here, Rockstar 101, a rock star's guide to survival and success in the music business. And uh, so tell me a little bit about what made you decide to write this book. Well, I'm just constantly being, yeah, well, look, you know, I'd always been asked, question you know you know i get emails or kids coming up to me at gigs and you know what's it like being on the road you know how do you put a team together you know just it, the, the usual questions you know there's been a lot of books written on the music business right let's be honest there's been a lot of books out there you, you know but prior to mine there was never a book written by a recording artist you know so this this is a bird's eye view of what it's like you know, putting a band together and putting a team together, you know, you, you know, you're, you're an up and coming, up and coming uh, um, artist, you know, a lot of times people are very, very quick to sign things they shouldn't be signing, you know, just to get that perceived leg up or that, that break, you know, but uh, as I said in the book, you know, signing uh, uh, a bad record deal is like, you know, getting yourself into a bear trap, you know, it's very easy to get into the trap and very hard to get out of it, you know. And so I, I just wanted to share my knowledge. You know, she, uh, there's a little bit of autobiog autobiographical stuff in there and some silly road story stuff. But most of it's, you know, um, and written in real easy to understand language. You know, you don't have to be an attorney to, to, to read my book. You have to be a, an attorney to read some of these books written by attorneys, you know. Yeah. Um, and so and that, yeah. that was the, the goal I was going for is it's just, you know, in in, you know, language of the people by the people for the people just you know just you know uh, pass on my knowledge you know and i've gotten so many emails throughout the years of people you know, from people who uh told me that you know they it was helpful to them you know when you see this book um the first thing i always think is well what does this person know you know you'll see a college professor and they'll say i'm going to show you how to be successful in the music business and then you go well ha he hasn't been though you know so when you see someone like you write a book, not only have you been successful in the performing end part of it, but also in the, um, the, you know, the publishing end of it, the business end of it. So you have the, the, the you can show it, you, you've done it. And I think that people relate to that more. And like you said in the book, you use a language that gets to the point. You don't, uh, people need to know. And you, you, I think you break it down um, very well. I want to ask you a question that uh, Paul Miles, he's a patron, he he asked, and this is a good one because I thought this too. Were there any bigger bands that asked you to audition it, during your career? Well, not bigger, but uh, I remember the black and blue guys. <laughs> uh, I think towards the tail end of Keel, uh, you know, Tom, Tommy's been one of my dearest friends. I saw Tommy 48 hours ago mm -hmm. in uh, – 
in Vegas and we were roommates. And, you know, of course, Keel and Black and Blue have very, very parallel stories. You know, two albums produced by Gene Simmons and Tommy and I wound up being roommates, at, you know, after Keel and, and uh, uh, Black and Blue broke up. But I remember, you know, being taken to lunch by Jamie and, and, and Tommy and, you know, they were thinking about making a move, I think, at one point in time. And they asked me if I'd be interested. And um, that was the only, that was the only, that was the only time really I, that I remember, you know, I wasn't getting calls from uh, Aerosmith or, you know, uh, or, or bigger bands, you know? Right, yeah. Okay, and then the last, thing because uh, this is 2017 you wrote a children's book and i never yeah. thought i would get to say on this show don't dilly dally silly sally tell me yeah. how this was about well you know as i mentioned to you when i moved here to los angeles i went from uh, zero to 60 very quickly and then fast forward you know uh 20 years uh when i got married and had my child i went from 60 to zero pretty quickly <laughs> <laughs> um so this came about uh, my daughter at a very early age it was it was apparent she was time challenged and you know um come to find out that you know i was not the only one with a time challenged child you know sometimes just getting kids out the door in general is tough but my daughter was pretty tough and um we were always running late for things you know we were running late for you know birthday parties and, and doctor's appointments and school, you know? And one day I just, I just, I don't know where this came from. I just blurted out, don't dilly dally, silly Sally, you know? I don't, I don't know where it came from, you know? It just, it just, it just blurted out. And I was like, hmm, there's something there. I was still working, you know, full time for Universal at the time. I, but I wound up in my spare time, you know, writing what became you know, what became the book, you know, initially it was, it was, it was a uh, kind of a long poem for her, you know, and then um, I started seeing everybody and their grandmother with children's books, lots of uh, recording artists with children's books, I think Billy Joel and Carly Simon, and, you know, just a lot of people were writing children's books, and I, I well, I can do that, you know, I started reading some of these books, and they, you know, anything, anything I couldn't do and so you know similar to the first process with the first book it's a manuscript you know you, you fine-tune the manuscript you send it around to everybody you get a lot of no's but you get I got one yes so that's that's how that started uh, and that's that was the culmination of the book that you have now very interestingly enough my daughter who is now uh, studying to be a graphic artist in animation she actually sketched some of the you know some of the sketchings her sketchings were used by the the illustrator so her dna is all over that book not only from the storyline point of view but uh, uh some of the sketches uh you know became the final illustration from the illustrator so and obviously it's you know it's a, a wonderful bonding uh, thing that we have with us you know she, she knows that uh that book was written about her and for her and she'll always have that you know and I've sold a lot of books to adults. I can tell you that. So many people have told me I did a lot of book signings. And if people go to my website, markferrari.com, I have some of the uh, TV uh, interviews that I did with the news stations. Uh, you know, you can navigate to that. And so many adults told me that, you know, it's a gag gift for an adult, you know, but there's, there's still some adults that are that are dilly dalliers. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's something that a lot of people uh, uh, struggle with. And uh, I was watching an interview with you uh, where you were discussing pu the publishing end of the music business and uh, with, with with Taxi and some of those uh, those things. And I saw someone walk by. I'm assuming it's your daughter. And I saw the dyed hair. Yeah. And I said, this has got to be his daughter. A am I right? Yeah, she's. Uh, yeah. These days, the hair color changes pretty, pretty often, you know, and she's been every color of the rainbow, you know, red green, yellow, blue. Recently, it's blue. So. Does she uh, know that dad was ahead of his time, though? <laughs> because uh, yeah, I don't know about that, but uh, right now she's sticking with blue. And her, mm -hmm. She's got a boyfriend with the same hair color. They're, they're like two peas in a pod. You know? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's and, may, and maybe my, you know, you know, maybe my, uh, my hair coloring had something to do with it. Who knows? 
<laughs> I think maybe you had some influence. I mean, at it, you've seen that hairstyles from a lot of guys later. Yeah. But I think it was one thing that people always associated with you. People knew Mark Ferrari. Oh, but he has that the hair as well, and 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 you've kept it. Well, there's a story behind that too. So when I first moved to Los Angeles in '84, everybody told me I looked like somebody else. I was getting Joe Perry, Steve Perry, Tommy Lee, Getty Lee. I don't even get getting it all, you know, over and over again, and. Finally, I just decided, you know, by the way, there's early keel pictures of me, you know, with, with, without the streak, right. you know. Uh, I think maybe even on the back of the lay down the law, I'd have to check. But, um, I, you know, one day I just I just wanted to, you know, I wanted my own identity, you know, and that's where this came from, you know. And, yes, uh, you know, it's been maintained ever since. And uh, I'm not the first guy with a blonde streak. You know, I borrowed it from uh, – Guys like Joe Perry. Joe Perry's back in the back in the seventies. His was on the side. He borrowed it from Keith Richards, who borrowed it from Hendrix. You know, even Hendrix had a blonde streak. So, uh, but now Joe Perry's wearing it here, as is Steven Tyler. So, you know, I don't know. It's come full circle. I, yeah. I don't know if they, you know, if, if I influenced that decision or not. But uh, Joe started wearing it in the front. You know, maybe five, six years ago. I'm not sure. But. Yeah, no, I, I believe me. It's as, fine. Yeah, as as is Stephen Tyler. So, uh, you know, if I'm a uh, fashion trendsetter, so be it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mark, plans for 2023? Places people can see you? Well, as I mentioned, there's Keel Fest that's been announced. Uh, it's in March of uh, I think March 18th, I want to say. But uh, RonKeel.com, uh, it'll be up on there. So that will be Keel. And um, possibly Cold Sweat playing there. Uh, Cold Sweat will probably be playing, a, you know, an outdoor festival or two, and uh, maybe the one of the cruises. We'll see. So, yeah. I I I um, I hope we play a lot. You know, I'd like to play more than once or twice a year. Yeah, and like I said, expose people to the music and also yeah. remind some people what maybe they missed. Yeah. Um, we'll have a link to your website. We'll have a link to all these things. People can uh, check out. I really appreciate you stopping by. I like to have a, a, a good success story sometimes. A lot of times there's a lot of depressing stories or hard times. Not that look, everyone has hard times, but it's great to see somebody come out of that scene and uh, have some success and now be able to do the things that you want to do because you love them, not because uh, they're going to turn the power <laughs> power off. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Thank Absolutely. you so much, Mark. And thank you for everybody for watching. And uh, make sure you check out everything in the description. Thank you. Party on. <laughs>